All right. In this presentation, I want to discuss the muscle tissue. Basically, in this talk, I want to talk about muscle at the microscopic level, and then in the next video, talk about the, you know how a muscle contracts to create movement. Now, before I actually get into the 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 topic, I, these websites here on this first slide, these are really really good resources for you guys to utilize. Um, you know, at outside of outside of these videos in your textbook this first one here is a website called interactive physiology um, this one is really great because there are a lot of animations on here for you to take a look at and it also coincides with our textbook Mary Evan Hohen so you know my students I mean you'll get the you know, a lot of the same information and visuals in here but if you're not using this book and you're in another class doesn't matter you know what book you're using this the information on this website is very good so check this out um, you know watch this video um, and then go to this website and then watch the animations of what I'm talking about and it'll really it'll really allow you to take all these puzzle pieces and put them together and paint a, a really beautiful picture of how all this works and then on the bottom here you guys have probably you guys have, are familiar with this website the histology um, website out of Delaware and um, you know again very very good images on here I encourage you guys to go and take a look at at um, you know at these uh, muscle tissues at the microscopic level there's lots of great pictures on here so you know check that out as well um, so on that note let's kind of work our way into muscles now when it comes to muscles I want to focus on a couple different things in this presentation what I'm going to take a look at are the types and characteristics of muscles so probably should delete that um, now the, the bulk of the focus is going to be on skeletal muscle and one thing you're going to learn as I make presentations about other the other two types of muscle tissue smooth and cardiac you're going to learn that there's a lot of similarities between these between the the tissues themselves there are their own independent differences as well but there's a lot of similarities so if you really gain a good in-depth understanding of how the skeletal muscle works you'll be on the right path to understanding cardiac and smooth muscle it'll be a lot easier so we'll take a look at just have a brief talk about the types and the basic characteristics of muscle tissue and then I'm going to put the bulk of my focus on the microscopic anatomy of a skeletal muscle and the contractile components of a skeletal muscle. So basically the components of muscle tissue that allows it to do its job. All right. So on that note, let's get into this. Now, muscle, if you want to really put one major function to muscle, that one major function is movement. Okay. Muscle tissue is responsible for allowing us to move. Okay, and there are three types of muscle tissue that we are that we that we concern ourselves with: skeletal muscle, cardiac, and smooth muscle. And you remember from learning histology about the the differences between these tissues and what they look like under the microscope, and some basic functional differences between them. Now it's time to get more in depth. Okay, but even though these are different in their own right they all have the same job they're there for movement purposes okay now obviously different forms of movement okay now when you guys hear the word movement you probably think of getting up and walking somewhere or running somewhere or basically getting from point A to point B all right and that's what skeletal muscle is responsible for all right but there are other movements that need to take place that are important for us to stay alive and functional as an organism okay for example cardiac muscle you know the you know the heart is essentially a pump okay the now the heart acts as a pump by continuously squeezing and then relaxing so it gets so when it squeezes it gets smaller and then when it relaxes it goes the opposite and gets larger again okay now when now when the heart squeezes okay when it contracts the blood is going to be forced out of the ventricles of the heart you know basically when the ventricles contract and that's going to allow for blood flow okay so the movements of the heart allow the you know create the pressures to drive the flow of blood okay so cardiac muscle creates a type of movement that's imperative to life smooth muscle okay smooth muscle remember it's a type of muscle tissue you find lining the hollow tubular organs of the body like your blood vessels your G the organs of your GI tract lymphatic vessels line you know basically you know the iris of your eye 
All right. And another area where smooth muscle is found is in the skin and what in forming what are called pilorectal muscles. Remember, pilo means hair. Okay. All right, here. I know it's not legible, but that's supposed to say here. All right, so smooth muscles. So the so this type of muscle tissue um, generates movements that are important for our life as well. But obviously, not getting from the chair to the fridge. You know what? The, you know with these tubular organs, you can probably guess what smooth muscle is going to do. It's going to basically control the diameter of these organs, okay? And if the smooth muscle contracts, the diameter is going to get smaller, and if it relaxes, the uh, the diameter is going to get larger. Okay? So if you let's say for example, you're in a situation where you like exercise, all right? When you're exercising, you need to get more airflow into your lungs to meet your metabolic demands. All right? The airways are going to dilate, okay? So you'll have some relaxation of the bronchioles and the airways will dilate. Okay, you need to control blood flow to muscles during exercise. You need to increase blood flow to muscles. So as a result, the vessels that, that circulate blood to your muscles are going to dilate. The vessels that are, that are found supplying your, your core organs, like your GI tract, um, are going to constrict because you need to, you need to reroute that blood flow from your organs to your muscles. Okay, in smooth muscles, what's responsible for that? You know, the movement of smooth muscle allows for a, a, an event called peristalsis that takes place in the body. Peristalsis is essentially the rhythmic muscle contractions of your GI tract, okay, such as your, your stomach and your intestines, okay? And you, you have to think about this. When you eat food, you swallow the food, okay? You have conscious control over that. You know, you chew your food, you swallow it. But then after that, you have no conscious control of what goes on. Okay, so, but you know that you digest the food, that it moves throughout your 20 feet of small intestine, your 5 feet of colon on its way to the rectum for you to poop out the waste. All right, now that's, so the movements of smooth muscle allow that to take place. Okay, so movement is a fundamental characteristic of all things that keeps us alive on many different levels. All right, from the microscopic all the way to the, you know, the large end of things. All right. And basically, one major, major property or characteristic of muscle cells you have to keep in mind, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in depth as we go, is that in order for movement to occur, muscle cells are able to shorten. So, for example, let's say this is a skeletal muscle cell. Remember from your histology talk, skeletal muscle cells are very long. They're elongated, tubular-shaped cells. All right. And when the contractile components of a muscle of a muscle cell shortens, it they're going to pull, and you know the components are going to pull on each other, and then the cell is eventually it's going to look more like this. It's going to be balled up. Okay, so the cell is going to shorten. Okay, so keep that in mind. When you see the word contract, you should think shorten. Write that down. Contract. Shorten. Okay. Now they do this by converting chemical energy into mechanical energy. Okay. By burning ATP. Okay. By burning ATP. Now contraction and movement is a very energy taxing process. Okay. It's a very, very taxing process. You know, you guys right now are probably thinking about exercise. Okay. You know, you're thinking about getting up and running and burning a lot of energy, but you have to remember your muscles are metabolically active when you're not working as well. Okay. Cause you have to think about this when you're sitting around right now, listening to this presentation or you're in class or you're driving down the road or you're watching TV, you're standing in the line at the grocery store. You have to maintain a posture. Okay. You maintain an upright posture. All right. And it takes muscle contractions to maintain the upright posture of your body as well. Okay. So as a result, in order to, so basically your muscles are never always relaxed. Okay. Muscles are, there are some muscles that are always contracting so you can maintain a, a relative body position and posture, um, you know, which is beneficial to us. So as a result, you're burning a lot of energy in order to, you know, use muscles. All right, you're burning a lot of energy to use muscles. So, um, so that's what I mean when we're saying burn, you know, converting chemical energy into mechanical energy. And you'll see that in the next video presentation when we talk about the physiology of an actual muscle contraction. Okay. Now, one thing to keep in mind about this as well, you know, 
remember, when we're talking about burning chemical energy, converting chemical energy into mechanical, we're talking about breaking chemical bonds, you know, catabolism. Okay, now remember, you have to remember when we're snapping a chemical bond, okay, that's energy that is released. Okay, that's energy that is released. And remember, a byproduct of metabolism is heat. Okay, is heat. All right, so another kind of indirect function of muscle or feature of muscle is that they generate a lot of body heat. That's a, this, is a, this is one of our big sources of body heat. All right, and so... So the metabolic activity of these muscles keeps us warm as well. That's why, I mean, think about it. When you get cold, you shiver, okay? Your nervous system stimulates your muscles to rhythmically contract, you know, more, not, not all your muscles, but the muscles of your extremities, such as your arms and your legs, so you can generate more heat to keep yourself warm while you're, re, while you're, re, while you're shunting blood flow to your core organs, all right? So muscles keep us warm, and that's very important as well. So, and one more thing to keep in mind that I want to mention about this as well is that, you know, I said that you're burning a lot of calories whether you're exercising or resting, all right? Now, you burn the bulk of your calories during rest, okay? You I mean, you're not exercising 24 hours a day. So, when it comes to losing weight and staying in shape, you know, one of the big things you have to do is make sure you have good muscle mass, lifting weights, strength training, all right? Now, that doesn't mean, you know, when people hear weightlifting and strength training, they think, oh, my gosh, I'm going to lift weights. I'm going to get all big and freaky looking. Okay, you know, lifting weights is not going to make you big and scary, okay? You know, there are certain ways you can lift weights, and there are certain training modalities that you can do to, so that you don't get like that. Most people who lift weights are not going to get big and buff, okay? Um, but by, by lifting weights and increasing your lean muscle mass, that's what we, you know, basically your, you know, your muscle versus fat mass, you're going to burn more calories at rest. And that's going to be a lot more beneficial to you than getting on a treadmill and doing, you know, the, you know, an hour of cardio. Don't get me wrong. Doing your cardio is important. Okay. But increasing your lean muscle mass is the really big long-term thing you need to, to focus on. Okay. Because like I said, look at the big picture. You're burning more calories at rest. So kind of so something to think about as well. All right. So that's essentially what we use muscle for, movement. And as a byproduct of the movement, we generate a lot of heat. Okay. Now, let's take a look at, you know, now what I'd like to do is, is break down the structure of, a, of muscle tissue from the muscle itself all the way down to the, to the molecular composition of a muscle. All right. So in, in, what we, in what we can call the structural hierarchy of skeletal muscle. All right. Now, when we take a look at skeletal muscle, you're, you, you see this picture sitting in front of you, and you'll notice that muscle is a very layered tissue. Now, I want to mention this, is muscle is very highly organized, okay? It's probably one of the most organized types of tissues and cells within the human body, all right? Just because, you know, and you'll see that as we go. Um, now, the organization of the muscle, you know, the, the beauty of the organization is it allows it to carry out its function very, very well, okay? Now, one thing you have to bear in mind, what you're looking at right here, this is what we would call the belly of a muscle, okay? The belly or the meat of a muscle, all right? The belly or the meat. Now, within that belly are all of these, um, are all these fascicles. Okay, fascicles or fasciculus for singular. Okay, or fasciculi, depending on what book you read. All right. Now, the belly of the muscle is where you find the skeletal muscle cells. Okay, this is what we would call the myocyte. Okay, the skeletal muscle cells. So let's say you've got this bone here. Let's kind of let's say this is a bone right here. And then this is a muscle cell, okay? So there's a couple of major parts to this muscle cell, okay? One is the belly of the muscle, and then two are the tendons, the origin and the insertion of a muscle, okay? You know, let's say this is the origin, and then this is the insertion. 
So what these are, these are attachment points. Okay, these are attachment points for the muscle to fuse to the bone. Okay, now when the muscle fuses to the bone, when we say origin and insertion, what we're talking about are the movable ends of a muscle. These are both fixed, but the, in the fixed points, meaning they're attached points, but the insertion of a muscle is the more highly movable end. Okay, there, there is some movement that takes place. So what I'm saying is when this muscle contracts, when this muscle shortens, okay, there's going to be some pulling on these tendons. There will be more pulling and movement taking place at the insertion than the origin. Okay, now within the belly of this muscle, one, you have to bear in mind that the cells, these myocytes, run the entire length of the belly of the muscle. All right, so let's say the belly of this muscle is 15 centimeters in length. The cells are going to be 15 centimeters in length as well. All right, if a muscle is 2 centimeters in length, the cells are going to be 2 centimeters in length. All right, so keep that in mind. Now, and, and, and the beauty of that is that allows for that, that allows for a lot of strength and power output, you know, for in, in a muscle contraction. Okay, <sighs> due to the organization of these. So, sorry, I had a little brain freeze there for a sec. So, origin insertion, the belly of the muscle. Now, when you break down the belly of this muscle where you find the, where you find the myocytes, the myocytes, the muscle cells themselves are highly organized, okay? And as I already mentioned, they're organized as fascicles within the muscle tissue, all right? Now, the fascicles, what they are, think of it as, this is the thought that always pops into my head, is I always think of Twizzlers pull and peel licorice, all right? So let's say you're, you're looking at, you guys know what I'm talking about. You guys know what Twizzlers are, the licorice. Now you get the pull and peel licorice. You get these long cylinders that are all kind of stuck together, all right? And then you can peel one little layer off. So let's say this is, you know, we're going 3D here, and then, you know, one circle on top of another. Pardon my art here, folks. Um, all right. So then, so then you pull... You know, then you can pull one little piece of that licorice off, and that would be the equivalent of one muscle cell. Okay, so you got that Twizzlers pull and peel licorice, and let's say you pulled off one little, you peeled off one little piece of that. That would be the equivalent of one muscle cell within there. Okay, a lot of people that that talk about muscle tissue like to describe it as a rope as well, and that's a very good way to think of it because rope is organized in these bundles. That are that are stacked on top of one another, that are eventually twisted on top of one another. So rope is another good example. Um, but what you're seeing here again is a lot of long cylindrical cells piled very neatly um, within each other. Now these cells are not physically touching each other. There is a little bit of space within these fascicles, and within those spaces, there you know those spaces are occupied by connective tissue. Okay, and as you can see in this image right here, these would be fascicles, and then all the white in between would be the connective tissue elements within those fascicles. All right. And that connective tissue that is found in here is what we call perimyceum. Perimyceum. Peri meaning around, surrounding. So this connective tissue is surrounding the fascicles. And then within this perimyceum, you can kind of see a hint of it here in this image. You can see that there are blood vessels. There's arteries and veins. And what they don't show in here is that there are nerves that are going into this muscle and innervating the cells as well. All right. And then we can take a look at these in individual myocytes, and you can see that even these myocytes are structured in layered cells as well. Now, these, these, these myocytes, the, the layers of this, these are what we call myofibrils. That's what you, when, you, when people say the, the word muscle fiber, that's what they're talking about, okay? The protein, the, the fibers, and basically what the myofibrils are, that's the protein composition, the, you know, the organized protein composition within the cell itself, okay? And, th and those myofibrils are highly organized proteins that, allow, that are where the contraction takes place. That's where the actual shortening takes place. So you can get the picture here, you know, why the muscle cell, when a muscle contracts, is going to ball up because, you know, let's say I, sti let's say I stimulate 50% of the muscle cells to contract, that's going to make a, the, a lot of this bell, you know, you have 50% of the cellular composition is muscle shortening, okay, that's going to make the muscle go bonk and ball up, okay. 
So that's how we organize the cells within a muscle. And then again, you can see in this image here, the connective tissue elements, okay? You can see that there is this epimyceum. Okay, epi meaning outer or around. And then you've got the perimyceum. Okay, you know, surrounding the fascicles. And then what they don't show you right now is, you can probably see some hints of it. You can see it looks like there's a little bit of white, white specks in, you know, within these fascicles themselves where the myocytes are located. That's what, that's what we would call the endomyceum. Okay, so basically... Um, oops, spelled that wrong. Okay. So basically that's, that. now remember the, the muscle cells are also not touching each other. There are small spaces between the cells and that endomycium is, you know, be, you know, is in between the spaces of the cardiac myocytes. All right. And again, that's where you're going to find blood vessels. That's where you're going to find capillary networks to supply these vessels with blood and oxygen and again, nerves as well. All right. Now in some books, the endomycium is often referred to as the basement membrane. Basement membrane. Okay, now remember when you're talking about epithelial tissues, remember epithelial tissues are ground on this, ge on this gelatinous like membrane called the basement membrane. And remember, epithelial tissues are, are composed of cells that are so densely packed together that there are no blood vessels in here. All right, so, but they still need to get blood flow and oxygen and nutrients. The basement membrane is the exchange medium. All right, and then remember, always underneath basement membranes, there's a realer connective tissue. All right, and remember that really spacey connective tissue where there's blood vessel networks, and then oxygen can flow you know, oxygen and other nutrients can flow or be exchanged to these tissues. So same thing with the, with the endomycium or the basement membrane within the, within these fascicles where the myocytes are, you know, same ordeal. That's basically an exchange medium where you can, where we can stick all these blood vessels. So there can be an exchange of nutrients and waste between the muscle cells and blood. All right. So keep that in mind. You know, and it's something to think about as well with this connective tissue. I mean, think about eating meat, okay? Because when you eat meat, you're eating muscle, the muscle tissue of an animal, all right? So let's say you want to make some meat in the crock pot, okay? Why do you do that besides the fact you had a busy day and you don't have time to cook? Okay, you put meat in, you slow cook meat in water, okay, because you want it tender, Okay, you slow cook meat in water because you want it tender. No, because meat, you know, meat tastes better. It's easier to chew when it's tender. All right. So what you're doing then when you're tenderizing that meat or you may, uh, you know, you may take a, a serrated mallet and beat the daylights out of a steak before you put it in the oven or grill it. Or you might take sharp objects and stab the, stab the meat to soften it up a little bit. Regardless, what you're doing when you're tenderizing meat, you're breaking up the connective tissue elements, you know, within, you know, within, the, within these fascicles, okay? So then, you know, so you're breaking up that perimyceum, a lot of it. All right, and obviously the epi and the endo as well, but you know we're you know primarily the, the perimyceum. So then let's say we're, let's go back to the crock pot. The heat from that water, all right, the heat from the water is you know is, the heat and the water put together are essentially going to be enough to break up the protein composition of this connective tissue. And then what what you're going to do is you're essentially going to loosen this up because remember connective tissue is really sticky. Right, connective tissue is essentially glue. When you look at Elmer's glue, okay, that's just a certain amount of proteins and water mixed together to make a sticky substance. All right, same thing with connective tissue. Remember, fibroblasts are cells that just crank out proteins that get stuck in the connective tissue, you know, in the extracellular spaces in between cells and tissues and make they make that extracellular matrix nice and sticky. So you're breaking up the protein components of the of the connective tissue, and what you're doing then is you're making these fascicles more or less separate and unwind and they're not stuck together as tightly. Then that meat is nice and soft and tender. Okay, so that's what you're doing when you're tenderizing meat is you're separating these connective tissue elements. All right, but like any other kind of connective tissue, it is important to have it because one, it, 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 it allows, well, the main reason is it allows for organization. Okay, you know, all the connective tissue in between all the spaces where there aren't cells, essentially, that allows for these, these long cylindrical fascicles and muscle cells to be highly organized and stuck together in a fashion that, well, keeps them organized so they can perform their function. Okay, so those are the connective tissue elements of the muscle tissue. 
And let's move. And then the last connective tissue element I wanted to mention is now all the can now this connective tissue. So right here, you see a skeletal muscle cell. You see another skeletal muscle cell, all right? And then you see a small amount of space in between there. So we're actually in the fascicle looking at the stacked muscles, all right? So which connective tissue would this be? We're inside the fascicles. These are individual muscle cells. Would it be the paramecium, the endomecium, or the epimecium? Think about it for a sec. That'd be the endomecium. We're within the fascicle. We're actually in where the cells are. Okay. Now you'll notice that that the that the protein fibers in between the muscle spaces will eventually run continuous in the spaces, and eventually what'll happen is they'll they'll start to organize, and you'll form what's called the myotendinous junction. So when you reach the very ends of these skeletal muscle cells. What you'll notice is that, well, I mean, th th there's ends of them, and you'll notice that, that the proteins become a lot more highly organized. Remember that dense, regular connective tissue, you know, the, the, the tissue composition of tendons, okay? And there will be some fibroblasts and cells in here that are cranking out some proteins as well, collagen, all right? But the you know again this basement membrane or endomycium is going to run continuous with this now so basically the ends of the skeletal muscle cells are going to be stuck to these tendons and as I mentioned before then when these cells contract and when they shorten towards the center of the belly of the muscle then you can see how these how these two tissues are continuous with one another and then we can pull on the tendons and create movement all right create mechanical me mechanical movement and this is what we call the myotendinous junction basically where the muscle cell meets up with the dense regular connective tissue of the tendon Okay, so that's essentially the connective tissue elements of the muscle. Now let's start taking a look at the at the at, at the muscle cells more in depth. Now these muscle cells are highly supplied with blood. Okay, there is a, there is a heavy amount of blood supply to these muscles because again these are extremely active tissues of the body. They need lots of energy, lots of um, lots of oxygen, lots of blood flow. Okay, so when you take a look at the vascularization of these muscles, you'll see that there the, that there's very dense capillary networks around here. Now, typically, the capillaries around these muscles, uh, you'll, you'll typically find about two capillaries, about two capillaries per muscle cell. Okay, now, what's interesting about this, though, is that there is an inverse relationship with these muscle cells, okay, meaning that, that the smaller, so think about this, so you can see how these capillaries kind of overlap these various muscle cells, okay, the smaller the cell, you know, the more capillarization that can take place okay now let's say I lift weights let's say I'm pumping iron like crazy and my muscles are getting bigger and bigger and bigger my muscle cells are getting larger and larger and larger okay what's gonna happen now what do you think is gonna happen you know let's say this one muscle cell gets really big you're gonna see as size goes up capillarization goes down I mean that's why if you're an endurance athlete one of the many reasons why if you're an endurance athlete and you pump a little too much iron, you may end up hurting your ability to run because you're gonna you're gonna have a harder time getting it, you know, efficiently getting as much oxygen to your muscle cells. Okay, so it's something to kind of keep in mind. So so basically, skeletal muscle cells are highly they're highly vascular. All right, and I'm and I'll talk much more later on more in A and P two when we get to the cardiovascular system about blood flow to muscles. But this is just something to think about that these are highly vascularized tissues all right now let's take a look at the um, at the skeletal muscle cell with more depth and what we call the myocyte and talk about some some appearances and characteristics about the muscle cell all right now for starters you remember from your histology presentations that cardiac I'm sorry cardiac skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated okay meaning multiple nuclei Okay, so essentially, and the reason why is because that's an embryonic development thing. Remember, when, when we were developing as embryos, there were these cells called myoblasts, okay, that, that, that eventually or, you know, came, organized themselves together and then started to fuse together. And then eventually, once these cells started to fuse together, you see that 
this they form this one long cylindrical functional muscle cell by the time we're born. All right, and then the, these nuclei, what they are, they're remnants of these myoblasts. Okay. And there are also some nuclei that you would see under the microscope that are also part of functional cells called satellite cells that are essentially in between the cell membrane and the basement membrane. Okay, and what satellite cells essentially are, these are cells that help us repair muscle tissue if we damage it really bad. Okay, you know, if we lift weights and break it up really bad, it'll, um, you know, these satellite cells may be activated and will help us repair some muscle tissues or maybe possibly regenerate some muscle tissue if there's a lot of damage. Okay, so that's where also some of the nuclei are coming from, all right? But skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated, all right? And they're like any other cell. They've got organelles like mitochondria. They've got an endoplasmic reticulum. They've got, you know, all the, all the other organelles you can think of, all right? But they have a lot of protein within them. They've got a lot of protein within them. About 75% of the composition of a, of a muscle cell, skeletal muscle cell essentially is water. You know, 5% is essentially inorganic salts. And the remaining 20% is protein. Okay, so one thing is, so the proteins in muscle cells are the contractile units. So basically when you look at these light and dark alternating bands of, you know, you see these, some of these dark, these lines, within the muscle cells themselves, all right, though, basically those are the contractile proteins that are, that are arranged in an organized fashion that allow for movement to take place when they contract, okay? So lots of protein, you know, within, within muscle cells as well. And basically, and we organize these proteins in what we call the myofibrils. I already mentioned that earlier. Okay, or the muscle fibers. Okay, and then you can see in between these muscle fibers that there are some mitochondria in here. So remember before we said that we convert chemical energy, ATP, into mechanical energy. So it's important that there's a lot, that there's a heavy amount of ATP within these muscles. Okay, within these muscle cells, so we can sustain work. All right. Now there are so there's so much protein within the muscle itself, you know, and you know within these organized myofibrils that the nuclei are pushed towards the periphery. Okay, it almost looks like when you're seeing this under a microscope that the muscle cells are on the outside of the cell, but they're really not. But they're but they're very but they're close to the surface of the cell, and they're right underneath what we call the the plasma membrane or the cell membrane and the the membrane of muscle cells has a specific name called the sarcolemma okay now this is like any other this is like any other plasma membrane okay it's a phospholipid bilayer and it controls the interactions of the cell with its environment okay there are you know there are protein channels in here there are there are gated channels there are receptors okay there's antigens there's i mean you know, they're just like any other cell, okay? But the sarcolemma has a couple of other, you know, has a little, some different features to it in that it helps form some of the, some more inner workings of the muscle cells, okay? And forming what's called the, the, the transverse tubules, which are part of the, sarco, which work with the sarcoplasmic reticulum to form what we call a triad, okay? So let's talk about this a little bit. So uh, surrounding all of these skeletal, uh, or uh, surrounding all these muscle fibers within within the uh, within the myocyte itself, um, there is this network of structures called transverse tubules. Okay, that's what the T is short for, transverse. Okay, and remember, transverse means horizontal. Okay, transverse means horizontal. Okay. Now, they don't really do a lot of justice in showing this in here, but in, in certain places along the, um, along the sarcolemma, there you, if we were to really look at this up close, you would see some holes in the sarcolemma. Okay, you would see some holes. So basically what the sarcolemma does is it dips downward and travels horizontally along these myofibrils. Okay, and these lines you see right here are essentially inward tubular foldings of the, of the, sarcolemma called the sarco, um, I'm sorry, called the transverse tubules or T-tubules. Okay, so think of this as an inward pouching of the, of the cell membrane 
you know, along hor traveling horizontally along these muscle fibers. So what's important about this then is that this allows for the actions that take place, you know, across the cell membrane to be carried into the muscle cell itself because muscle cells have to be stimulated to contract and there and this is a process, okay? Once we excite the muscle cells and muscle tissue, then that that excitement will travel down the transverse tubules and then and then you'll see a chain reaction of events taking place, okay? And I'll talk much more in depth about that in the next presentation. So you've got these transverse tubules and then running horizontally along the, um, or actually running more parallel to the muscle, to these myofibrils, is the structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which we're just going to abbreviate the SR. That's what people, that's what everybody abbreviates it as. Now, what the what the SR is, the smooth, the the, the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum. What it is, it's a specialized form of smooth ER, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, now the smooth ER in skeletal muscles or in muscles in general is a storage site for calcium. Okay, it's a storage site for intracellular calcium. All right, now calcium is extremely important to a muscle contraction. Without calcium, contraction will not take place. Okay, and you'll see that more in depth later on. But when we need to stimulate a muscle to contract, okay, that wave of depolarization or that ex or the exciting signal travels down the transverse tubules, and then that stimulates the SR to release its calcium, and then the calcium will travel down the tubules and actually in to the contractile proteins of the myofibrils themselves. And then from there, the calcium will play an important role in the muscle contraction. So the SR is the storage area for intracellular calcium, all right? And then you can see these mitochondria squished in between the myofibrils as well. And remember, these are your powerhouses, your ATP factories, so we can, so we can continue to, pour, to perform work, all right? So those are the major organelles or components of the skeletal muscle cells you need to focus on. Now let's actually start going a little more in depth. And then right here you can see this, this triad, um, you know, the ultra structure of this triad. Okay, you can see the tubules here and then the sarcoplasmic reticulum here. And then all of the, um, and then, you know, again, you can't see the calcium, but there's calcium stored within here, all right? And then you can see the alternating light and dark patterns of the myofibrils that these are traveling horizontally right over, all right? So, now let's break, so let's say we take all of that away. We look at an individual myofibril. Okay, we look at a mile, we look at an in individual myofibril. Okay, we, so in this, we, we, we isolated a, a muscle fiber. We took away the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the transverse tubules, the SR, all that stuff. And you can see then that there are these, that there's these interesting alternating patterns along the muscle fiber, okay? And what these are, these are the contractile units or the contractile proteins of the muscle, of the muscle cell itself, okay, or the muscle fiber. Now, this from line to line like this is what's called a sarcomere. Okay, the sarcomere is the functional unit of muscle. Okay, I'm going to talk more in depth about the sarcomere in a little bit, but I want to, but I want to say this. Now remember, functional units are the smallest organized parts of a machine that allow it to do its job, okay? So functional units are the smallest organized parts of a machine, okay? And the functional units of, of, of muscle, the sarcomeres are composed of different proteins, and these proteins are what we call contractile proteins. Okay, and you'll see some look thicker and darker and smaller and thinner than others, okay? And, you know, what do you notice about the organization of these thick and thin uh, proteins? Or these proteins have a specific name. We call them filaments. Okay. What do you notice about these? They're alternating. Okay. They're alternating. So you see the thick filaments in the middle. And then you see the thin filaments kind of out to the periphery. Okay. So you see thick and thin filaments. All right, now think about this for a second. 
Think about this. Now these filaments inter. Whoa! Sorry about that. My eraser is going crazy on me. These filaments interact with one another, so we can perform a muscle contraction. Okay. These fil these filaments interact with one another, so we can perform a muscle contraction. All right. Now. The interaction, now when we talk about these filaments interacting with one another, you have to think about this. Because of these overlap, there's a little bit of space in the middle. These filaments, these proteins are going to essentially attach to one another and pull on one another, and that's what's going to cause the muscle to shorten, okay? And like I said, we'll take a look at that in a little bit. But the shortening of those sarcomeres creates a contraction. And then right here, you can essentially see the organization of these sarcomeres within the muscle itself. Now, mu now myofibrils, you know, muscle fibers, are composed of many, many, many different sarcomeres. Okay, well, they're all the same thing, but, you know, many sarcomeres, okay? And the contraction of all these sarcomeres will allow the cell to shorten. Now, let's, let's break down the organization of the sarcomere a little more in depth, okay? So as we take a look at this, again, you'll notice that there are two, there are two major types of protein filaments, okay? And those are what are called actin and myosin, okay? Actin is what we call the thin filament. Myosin is what we call the thick filament okay actin and myosin thin and thick all right so you can so after saying that you can gather which ones on here are the actin and myosin okay the actin is obviously the thin blue filaments you see here and then the myosin is are are these thick red filaments you see here okay um now, you'll notice then that there are these little heads on the myosin filaments, okay? There are these little heads. So what happens, now remember I said just a, a second ago, these sarcomeres shorten when they contract. So think about this. There's, this. there's this overlapping nature of these proteins, all right? So let's say these heads started to attach, and then they started to kind of cock inward, all right? You can see then that they're going to pull on this actin, and they're gonna be, this actin is going to be pulled towards the center of the sarcomere. All right, and then as it's pulled towards the center of the sarcomere, that's going to essentially make the muscle cells shorten. Okay, so the interaction of those filaments allows for shortening to take place. Okay, now when we look at the organization of the sarcomere, when we look at the organization of the sarcomere, there are, as you look in these bottom images here, my eraser. Sorry, folks, about bouncing back and forth between this. Okay, when you want to take a look at the organization here. Now, what you'll notice here, let's say we're taking a look at the thick filaments. Okay. Now, think about this. Let's say you were looking at this under a, under an electron an, an electron scope microscope. Okay. What would this area look like in the center where it's very where there's all this myosin? Okay, all you see here is pure myosin. You're going to think this is darker in appearance, okay? And then on the periphery of the sarcomere where there's actin, it's going to be more light in color, okay? And then obviously in the, in, you know, on the middle slash periphery of the sarcomere where there's, an, where there's the overlapping nature of these filaments, it's going to be, you're going to, it's going to be a mix, in terms of color. You'll see this in a second when I show you an image of, of this, okay? So what you'll notice then, if you kind of look at this, if you want to think three-dimensional, so you'll notice that there is an, a myosin filament in the center, and then you can see that actin arranges itself around the myosin filaments in a hexagon-like fashion, okay? So when we're contracting a muscle, okay, this, this this myosin filament is interacting with more than one actin filament at one time. It's interacting with as many as it can surrounding them. And that's what these heads do. Okay, these heads essentially reach up, stick to this, and then pull the actin inward toward the center of the sarcomere. All right. Now, there are other proteins in here that are organizing the sarcomere. For example, this stringy 
one you see here, that's called Titan. Okay, Titan essentially just is attached to the tails of the mice and, and keeps them organized and anchored in place. Okay, there are proteins called C proteins on the myosin that that help us, you know, keep these heads in a certain position. There's what's called alpha actin. You know, a lot of that's within these Z lines. Okay, these, these Okay, for organizational purposes. Okay, so there's a lot of other proteins associated with the sarcomere that keep it organized, but our main focus is, is going to be on the actin and myosin. Okay. Now let's kind of break these microfilaments down in, in a little more depth and talk about these, okay, within the sarcomere. So let's talk about myosin first. Myosin, as I mentioned before, is a thick protein. Myosin is a thick protein, okay? Now, what myosin is composed of, it's, it's, it basically it's comprised of about six different proteins that are wound around each other, okay? And myosin is made up of what, are, what we call heavy chains and light chains, okay? as you can see here. So you can see the, the, the weaving nature of this. So then we take these woven like golf clubs and then pile them all together and then we get this nice thick protein filament. Now if we take a look at the head of myosin, okay, if we take a look at the head, what you're going to see, you're going to see these heavy coiled chains, okay, then you're going to see a couple of thin type filaments, okay, branching out from there. Now, on the very ends of these heads, there are two there are two important things we have to focus on. There's an enzyme that's located about here that's called ATPase. ATPase. So think about this. Remember, when you see ASE at the end of a word, you should think enzyme. Okay, you should think enzyme. And then this this enzyme is obviously obviously specific for ATP. Now. This this enzyme, what it does is it hydrolyzes is it hydrolyzes ATP, meaning it breaks ATP down. Okay, and remember before I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation the the breakage of chemical bonds of ATP, you know, taking chemical energy and converting that into mechanical energy allows for movements. Okay, so the so the chemical reactions of breaking down ATP occur at the head of the myosin. And then on the very ends of the myosin, there is going to be what's called a, basically a binding. There's also going to be a binding site on actin as well. Okay, so this is the part that's going to stick to the actin, the actin filament that is slightly overlapping it. Okay, and... So bear that in mind that the that the that the head of the myosin is going to be interacting with ATP and the actin filament simultaneously. But the interactions of the but the actions of both of those areas are going to allow for a contraction to take place. All right. So myosin, the thick filament, and then actin obviously is the thin filament. Okay. Now actin has other regulatory proteins that are associated with it, and these regulatory proteins are important to talk about for a second. So these two regulatory proteins on here on these thin filaments are called troponin and tropomyosin. Okay, troponin and tropomyosin. Okay. So the yellow here would be troponin. Okay, and then these long strings would be tropomyosin. Okay, troponin, tropomyosin. Now you'll notice that there are these, they look like indentations within the within these uh within these uh proteins of the actin. Okay. Now these indentations, those are what we call, you know, I just mentioned this earlier, the active binding sites. Okay, so that's where the head of the myosin is going to reach up to and then stick to the actin. All right. Now you'll notice, though, that there is this protein, tropomyosin, covering the active binding sites. Okay. So when a muscle is resting, when a muscle is not contracting, these active binding sites are essentially covered, and actin and myosin cannot stick to one another. So there will be no movement taking place. All right. But this is where calcium comes in. So when we release that calcium, 
Okay, when we release that calcium from the from the SR, that calcium is gonna is gonna travel down those transverse tubules, and then it's and as it diffuses down, it's going to bind to troponin. Okay, and then and then troponin, what it's going to do is that is when that when when we form this complex of calcium and troponin, that's going to create a conformational change in these regulatory proteins, and then these regulatory proteins are going to twist. And they're going to twist off of these active binding sites, and these active binding sites are now exposed. Okay, and that's the importance of calcium within the within this uh, muscle contraction. As long as there is calcium available, you know that these myosin heads are going to be able to form in, are going to be able to interact with actin and stick to it because the binding sites are going to be exposed. Okay, and then we'll talk about the actions of the the contraction phase of a muscle in a little bit. But that's you know that's the importance of calcium in this situation. All right, so actin is the thin filament that has these regulatory proteins associated with it. And like I said, at rest, these um, these uh, these regulatory proteins are covering the active binding sites, preventing what what's called a cross bridge from forming. Okay, so on a myosin, so on a myosin head literally attaches to an actin filament, that's what we call a cross bridge, okay? And that's what these regulatory proteins prevent. Unless the calcium is bound to them, then cross bridge cycling can take place. Okay? And then we put these all together and then again you have the sarcomere. Okay, you've got the sarcomere. So you can see the thicker filaments here, the actin filaments. You can see these heads reaching upward, and then you can see how they would be interacting with the myos or with I'm sorry, with the actin filaments. So myosin, actin, thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin. So you can see why those striations are formed on skeletal muscle cells because of the overlapping nature of these thick and thin filaments. All right, and then this right here, you can see you know bundles of sarcomeres all piled on top of one another. All right, now let's talk about the sarcomere in a little more depth and the various parts of a sarcomere, okay? The various parts of a sarcomere. Now here, this would be some SR, sarcoplasmic reticulum. We'd be looking at some mitochondria here. Um, this is a full sarcomere right here, all right? So you can see these myofibrils stacked on top of one another. Now let's take a look at this sarcomere. Let's, I want to use this picture to break down the parts of it a little more in depth, or the overlapping nature of these proteins. Now, the, now there are these lines, these bordering lines that are called Z lines. Okay, they're called Z lines. Okay, Z lines. Z stands for Zweischen. It's a German word. Okay. So these Z lines are the borders, okay? Now you'll notice I've already brought this topic up before and you can see the comparison in these pictures right here. You'll notice that there within the sarcomere you see these light areas, you see these and you see some kind of intermediate areas and then you can see some very dark areas. Okay, so basically what you're looking at, when you're looking at the different coloration, what you're essentially seeing is which myofilaments, uh, which, which fibrils are you actually looking at. So if it's very light on the outer edges of the sarcomere, that's where you're going to primarily find actin. Okay, it's primarily where you're going to find actin. All right. Within the middle then, you know, obviously that's going to be more, you know, that's going to be more pure myosin. And then kind of in the outer edges of all this, that's where you're going to see a combination, the overlap of actin and myosin. Okay, actin and myosin. Now, this area where it's pure actin, where it's very light in color, that's what we call the I band. Okay, so we call the I band. Okay, this area where it's essentially pure myosin. Okay, where it's pure myosin, that's what we call the H band. All right, and then basically where there's all this overlap taking place, that's what we call the A. Band. 
Okay, and this very dark line in the middle, that's called the M line, okay? Those are proteins that are found with, you know, within the center of the sarcomere that, again, just help keep the sarcomere organized, all right? So the M line. Now, you take a look at that sarcomere, okay? You take a look at the I band. You take a look at the H, you know, the, the, uh, the, the A band, okay? You take a look at that H zone. Sorry, I forgot to write that. Okay, you take a look at all this. Now, what is going to happen to the sarcomere when the muscle contracts? Take a look at this picture here for a second. Let me erase some of this business here. Okay, what do you think is going to happen when these myosin, when these myosin filaments, oh, my eraser. Oh, man, what the heck? Okay, what's going to happen when these myosin filaments interact with this, with the actin? Because remember, what you know what happens is actin is pulled towards the center of the sarcomere actin is pulled towards the center all right what's going to happen to the to the bands in the in here let me ask you this what's going to happen to the h zone okay what's going to happen to the area where it's pure myosin this okay what do you think is going to happen let's take a look at this picture and compare there is no H zone now. Okay, in this contracted muscle, there is no H zone. Okay, because as you can see down here, all right, these actin these actin fibers were pulled towards the center, and there's a slight overlap with them at the center. Okay, so essentially, you'll still see a little bit of that M line, those very very dark proteins, but now this just looks like one giant A band. Okay, and then you see a little bit of the eye out in the set out here, and then again you can see the Z discs, the borders of the sarcomeres. Okay, so essentially when a muscle contracts, when we stimulate that sarcomere to contract, the filaments are all pulled towards the center. Okay, and then think of millions of these at once, you know, uh, millions of these sarcomeres contracting at once and pulling towards the centers of the sar. Uh, okay, and then you can think about how that muscle is going to shorten. Okay, it's going to shorten in its length, and then it'll pull on the tendon, all right, it'll pull on that insertion, the movable end of that muscle, and then we'll be able to, you know, lift your arm or, you know, move a bone, all right? And this is what we call the sliding filament theory, okay, the sliding filament theory. This is, so what we're saying here, are these filaments slide, you know, over one another and pull the sarcomere shorter, and then that's what pulls the muscle shorter and allows for a contraction to take place, the sliding filament theory. Okay, so again, if we kind of go back to this picture, all right, so again, you can see a sarcomere right here. Sorry, folks, I apologize for my eraser having a mind of its own. Okay, so you can see right here, here's a sarcomere. Okay, you can see that there's an M, M, then there's a little bit of an H zone, a lot of A, and then a little bit of I. Okay, so think about it. If this, arc, if this muscle were to contract, this center would disappear. It would just be one big A band. Okay, now picture all of these going at once. Okay, all these contracting at once. And then, you know, so you've got, so you've got these, hundred, you know, these thousands and millions of mile fibrils you know, pulling towards the center, and then that makes the muscle contract. That's the sliding filament theory. Okay, and like I said, as long as there's ATP and calcium available, the, you know, this is going to take place. Okay, we'll be able to continue and sustain a contraction like exercise. There's other variables as well, but, you know, those are required for this. Okay, so that's essentially the microscopic makeup of a skeletal muscle cell. All right, so, you know, again, go back, review, you know, you know, watch this video, you know, read about this, go look at those other websites I was talking about, you know, take a look at this, you know, a big thing you got to understand is the sarcomere, okay, the, the overlapping nature of the filaments of the sarcomere, okay, from the, whoops, okay, you know, the, how actin and myosin overlaps one another, okay, and how the, how the fibers are pulled towards the center of the sarcomere, how the Z lines come closer together when a muscle contracts, and then when the muscle goes back to relax, how the Z lines move back away from one another. Okay, because like I said, understanding the overlapping nature of the sarcomere will, you know, the function, the unit of the muscle will be the key to really understanding the muscle, you know, 
imagining this process taking place. All right. So again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. And um, the next video, I will go into the actual muscle contraction itself.